So hello and welcome to Scientist Warning TV. Um, I'm Alison Green and I'm Executive Director of Scientist Warning. Um, you can look us up on www.scientistwarning.org. We're a non-profit organisation dedicated to raising awareness of the, the scientist warnings to humanity um, and educating the public on um, the crisis, how bad it is and what we can actually do about it. Um, if you haven't done so already, please take a minute to subscribe to our channel, um, www.scientistwarning.tv. Um, then we will send you regular updates and notifications about our latest interviews and um, events. So, um, I have initiated a new series which is called um, Women in Science, and I'm delighted to have as my first interviewee Professor Julia Steinberger from the School of Earth and Environment at Leeds University. So first of all, Julia, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I wondered if you could tell us something about your background, please, um, and how you came to be an ecological economist. Um, as I understand it, you look at connections between resource use and societal well-being. And how, as an ecological economist, you came to be in a department of earth and environment. Ah, well, okay. The, the second question is a bit easier to answer than the first one, or at least shorter. Uh, the first question, so how, how, what was my journey? So my journey is I started out being very quantitatively oriented. Um, I studied math and physics at university. I have a PhD in experimental physics. And um, I, during the process of the PhD, I became dissatisfied, which I hear is not uncommon, but um, I became very dissatisfied uh, with just studying physics when there were so many other things happening in the world. Uh, around and what I, I wanted to do is I didn't want to embark on a new project and a new topic without making absolutely sure that this was the kind of thing I wanted to work on um, really uh, to play a constructive role. So I actually spent a lot of time after my PhD, so I would say a good one, one and a half to two years trying to figure out what I wanted to do and I recommend that if you're okay taking odd jobs um, it's definitely worth it because what I what it allowed me to do is it allowed me to be absolutely certain that I wanted to focus on systemic aspects. So I didn't want to foc I didn't want to take the question as given, and I think that physics is a good foundation for this. You always want to make sure that the the you're, you've just find the system you're studying in such a way that you can interrogate the the biggest features it has that are causing the problem or causing the thing that you're trying to study. And if you zoom in too slow, too close, or you say, oh, I'm just gonna focus on this technology or making better solar panels or more efficient widgets or whatever, you're kind of taking the superstructure as given. And you're kind of accepting other people's view of what the question is and what the solution would be. So I didn't want to do that. And ecological economics, uh, I actually started out in industrial ecology, which is sort of a systemic understanding of um, the resources, materials, and energy that uh, uh, economic systems use. And then I focused in on uh, ecological economics, which is, again, a systemic under understanding of um, the interactions between the economy and the environment, and how we can see the economy embedded within society as an expression of social relations, and embedded society itself embedded in the biosphere, embedded in the physical world, the natural world that surrounds us, and we're obviously doing things to it. And so that's why I wanted to study ecological economics is because it allows a sort of macro systemic perspective where you sort of zoom out and try to understand the big picture before you try to say something about what we might want to change or how we might want to change it. Uh, why I'm in the School of Earth and Environment, well, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to find ecological economists in real economics departments. We're not welcome. We don't, we're not welcome to publish in real, real economics journals, although it turns out the Journal of Ecological Economics is now highly ranked and like, you know, academics have these metrics. It's a cool journal now. So real economists are sort of coming into our journal to publish now, possibly a few too many because they're not very um, necessarily critical of, you know, the, the economics as a discipline and the problems it's been accomplished with an accomplice of, a very willing accomplice of. Um, but uh, yeah, so in general, ecological economists are in geography or in gender studies maybe, or in a lot of them in environmental um, uh, departments, but rarely in economics departments. I applied once for a job in an economics department, not go well. 
<laughs> wow. I mean, I think you're probably incredibly well placed in, in the department that you're in because you're obviously bringing a very unique and important perspective. So it's, you know, obviously getting, they're getting a sort of multidisciplinary view. Um, and I really like your description of what ecological economics is actually doing. Um, and how interesting that the economists don't want to know. It doesn't, it doesn't surprise me, I have to say. Um, and, you know, and, and, and that's great and all, all power to you. Um, now, when I spoke with Bill Ripple the other week, uh, yeah, he's been in this business a while. And, and I'd like to put to you the same question I put to him. And I said, how does he continue to motivate himself? You know, year after year, when you when you you, you know you engage in the, the you know with with the cops and the IPCC process, and it's failure after failure after failure. And I'm interested in, you know, the sort of resilience of scientists and how you can, how you can keep going. You know, what motivates you, and how do you how do you cope with the frustrations of what's happening all around you? Um. Okay, so I think that one of the ways I don't I'm not sure I cope particularly well. I'm not sure I'm coping. Um, you know, the <laughs> uh, one of the but I, I, I think that there may be two two elements of response. Um, one is one of the things that's keeping me going is activism. And in particular, the fact that in the last couple of years, so in the last couple of years, my mental health has um, gotten a lot better. Because I feel a lot less alone now. I feel a lot less alone in carrying the knowledge that we're headed for a disastrous trajectory and that we need to change things fundamentally from the ground up, that it's not going to be tweaks on the system, that we can't expect enlightened politicians to do it for us, and that it's really going to be a, a, a big struggle, a big effort to change everything in our societies to allow uh, human life to continue in decent circumstances on Earth. And the reason I feel less alone about that is because there are movements like the student strikes, um, there are movement like XR, so Extinction Rebellion is, has been great. Um, I consider myself to be part of Extinction Rebellion, sometimes a critical friend, sometimes just a friend friend, sometimes just somebody who's holding a sign and shouting. Um, and, uh, and that's really been such a boost because it does not feel like I'm alone anymore and that I'm just writing papers and doing nothing. So I think that that's a big boost is realizing that if we do get allow ourselves to have bigger voices and to call on other people, that there is a response that from the public that people do want to change things. They do not want this disastrous course. There's one of the, the, one of the most harmful ideas in neoclassical economics is that people are just sort of these consumer robots and that all they want is the bigger television and, and that you could never interest them in anything else. And these movements for alternatives really show that that's not what people are interested in. People are interested in justice, they're interested in rights, they're interested in um, uh, dignity and life chances and doing the right thing. And I think that now we're seeing that with Black Lives Matter um, in spades, is that we're, we're seeing that people don't just want to, you know, people have, there is a struggle for survival out there. Um, for the Black communities, it's extremely present and real. And, and, and there's an echo of that, you know, that people, once they see this injustice, once they see this harm taking place, they really do want to change things. So that's for me is a huge, tremendous boost. Um, and mm -hmm. the other element of answer is that I think that we need to study this failure of the scientific community and the role of the scientist. That has to be a topic of study as well. Why did we ask the question in such a way that our answers would be ineffective? The answers in terms of the physical science are correct. Like reality is reality, you understand physics and whatever, and it's fine. But in terms of how we understand what needs to change in society and in the economy, and how did we get it so wrong? How did we make our intervention in the social and economic system so ineffective? And understanding where that, um, where the, where the sources of that failure take, took place. Uh, and I think that it has to do with, you know, neoclassical economics and neoliberalism and the role of the scientist as being the sort of neutral expert who is, should be apolitical and never express emotion. Like all of these things mm -hmm. are real problems and are probably going to kill us all before it's over and done with. But if we understand where that failure is coming from, it gives us tools to act against it. And I think that again, the, the you can wake up in the morning and want to analyze where you, why you messed up. If you're a scientist, you, you can mess up. That's your job. You can make mistakes. That's your job. But you have to get up in the morning and try to understand where you went wrong. And so mm -hmm. that's I what, one, uh, what motivates me in my work is trying to un 
unpick where in that system we should do things differently, where we can do things differently. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Okay. And you put it really well. And there's some really interesting things there in what you've said. I'm, 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 at the moment, I'm particularly interested in that issue of, you know, accountability. And, you know, there's a little bit of finger pointing going on, people pointing the finger at scientists and saying, why haven't you been more active? But I'd like to come back to that one just for a moment. But in, in, in the context of, of what, what you just said about, you know, knowing how bad it is, even even accepting that the, the situation is pretty bad, there are different views, aren't there, as to just how bad it is. Um, and every week there seems to be, you know, a report in the Guardian or or in the press, the New York Times or something like that, that says, you know, it's, we didn't realise this. So, for example, recently we've got a point about climate sensitivity, um, you know, being the climate is much more sensitive to CO2 than we'd mentioned, and therefore warming might be greater. Um, and in a sense, that, you know, there are, there are people who are in denial about everything that's going on and there's the delays. And then, as Michael Mann says, there's the group of doomers and who, who feel that it's game over. And yes, why, why, why bother? Um, and I wondered whether you had any thoughts about, I guess it's a continuum, isn't it? But how do we disentangle the, you know, the robust science, which is telling us, you know, telling us, you know, the, the way the way things really are. So, how do we sort of be more, more effectively disentangle that from the the rather more extreme sort of alarmist views, which um, which sometimes prevail? So, for example, you know, we do get some situations where there are some some groups on social media who are you know very into that you know, human extinction dialogue. Um, so, I guess I'm asking how you know where how how can we more effectively draw the lines and protect the public from misinformation? Yeah, so I think the public needs protecting from misinformation. I don't think the public needs protecting from bad news. And I think that that's, uh, these are two different, two different um, debates. And I think that the public has been protect, I mean, you know, why, why, the, the, maybe, maybe this goes back to the question of well, what did scientists do wrong? And I think, uh, you know, why weren't they more vocal? Why weren't they shouting down, you know, knocking on BBC office doors and so on? So one of the reasons is because we're told that if we're too loud or too emotional, we lose credibility. That's sort of been the narrative that we tell scientists, like, if you're not just like a neutral person who writes papers and doesn't care if anybody reads them, then you don't have a voice at the table anymore. You, you cease to be a, a credible scientist. And of course, that's complete nonsense. Um, but I think one of the one of the issues is that there's been a lack of information and not just a lack of credible information, a lack of information full stop. Um, there's really been this sort of news blackout, which I think is to a large extent engineered. Because while the scientists were being told, shut up and just write your papers and don't worry if nobody cares or does anything about the fact that you're discovering information about the end of the world, um, there's been this other side that's been very vocal and very active, which is the, the fossil fuel lobbies and the industrial lobbies. And they advertise in newspapers like crazy, which I don't think is completely neutral. Um, you know, they sort of keep media organizations going through, through the revenue of car sales and far, far away holidays and all of that stuff. So, um, and, and they've been very organized in terms of setting the agenda uh, with policymakers and politicians as well. And they made it uh, something that Michael Mann, um, for instance, has been the, the heinous target of, right? Mm -hmm. they, they really hate him tremendously for decades now. When he, they started when he was a postdoc or something. Um, and and you, you, you see a scientist who should have all the answers getting attacked like that, you don't want to step into that fray as a journalist, right? You don't want to put yourself out there because you're going to get yelled at by the scientist because you get something wrong. And that's always true when you do science reporting. And then you get yelled at, you're going to get yelled at by this fossil fuel lobby and they are nasty. <laughs> you know, they love it when people get death threats, right? They, they want to make anybody who puts their head above the parapet to report on this stuff a target. And they're losing control of the debate now slightly, but they had that control for decades. And I think that when we're talking about why we are where we are now, we have to remember the role that they played in setting the terms of debate. And the fact that we're coming all of a sudden with this really, really bad news, despite the fact that the papers and the science and whatever has been published for years, um, that it sort of comes as a surprise to people, that it comes as such a big shock is partly because, um, because we've been in this machine of disinformation and that we haven't had the tools to 
fight back uh, sufficiently. And what that means is that with respect to the, the, the Doomer debate is that sometimes it comes as a shock to the system. It's like, if you weren't reading those papers, if you didn't see that news reported, it might just come as this huge surprise, like I had no idea things were so bad. I've gone from my life is okay to the world is heading off a cliff. All right, I'll just give up. It's just too, it's just too big of a gap, you know, between like our normal lives and the, the kinds of messages and things we're supposed to be doing on a daily basis and where we see things are at. And that, that shock and that gap between where we are and where we need to be is, is too big for people to process. And then they're like, you know what? I'm not gonna do the hard work of trying to figure this out. I'm just gonna give up right now. And then there's these, these comforting messages, which is where the Doomer, the Doomer um, narrative comes in, which is you are justified in giving up. Yes, the news is bad. Yes, it's going to be hard work. You know what? It's too hard. Don't even try. And so it seems to me like, and this is something that um, that Trump did actually beautifully in the first uh, first six months of his presidency. I think he went from climate denial, like it's a hoax, mm -hmm. to climate change is so far advanced that there's nothing we can possibly do about it. So we're not going to regulate emissions on vehicles anymore. Like boom, boom. He didn't go through the it's real and we can do something about it face. <laughs> he went from the, directly from the, it's not real, la la la, I don't hear you, it doesn't exist, to the, oh, it's too far gone, let's just drive off the cliff in our big SUVs mode. And I think that that's sort of the mentality that a lot of the, the Doomer narratives have, is they don't go through what do we do about it, or they don't want to try to think about what we can do about it. And there's a reason why that's also, um, in a lot of cases, when you look around and say, what can we do about it, where you don't find the toolkit of what you do when there's a planetary disaster with the wrong economic system and politics um, is because we don't learn about organizing. We don't learn about social mobilization. We don't learn about revolutions. We don't learn about massive system change and how we can play a role in that. And that's something that I'm trying to educate myself in. I know a lot of people in XR and Extinction Rebellion are trying, you know, a lot of the people who are activists around this, we're trying to educate ourselves, but it's not something we're taught in school. Mm -hmm. And just now we're starting to have also a bit of um, scientific backup. So for instance, Fergus Green, who's a young researcher, I think he's now in the Netherlands, writing about anti-fossil fuel norms. How do we change the cultural and social perception of society on these fuels so that they're not, um, uh, so that they're, they're expelled from our society on those grounds? Because we just decide we don't want to any, have anything to do with them. How do we, um, talk about social tipping points. Yes, we have planetary tipping points, but we can change the social system really fast, much faster probably than the planet or the technology. And, well, and so exactly. think, yeah. yeah, I so, mean, we, we, we saw with COVID, I mean, we, we saw with COVID what, we, what yeah. we're actually capable of, what, what we can do. Um, and again, I mean, great answer. You've said so many really interesting things there. Um, and I'm struck by, by you know, the way you talk with, with great passion about being an activist and also being a scientist. And I wondered if you might say something about you know, how easy is it to be a high profile academic and, and an activist? Because I know, you know, you're one of our more active activists. You know, you, you take part in XR events. Um, you advocate for XR. Um, when I've spoken with, uh, with some other scientists, they, they will say to me sort of off the record that they are discouraged from activism by their institution and that there's this prevailing sense that if you are an academic who's an activist, there's a black mark against you that you're, you're somehow being watched. So, is it? Do you feel? Do you feel that the academic world supports you in in activism and in raising your voice and in trying to do the right thing? Um, it's an interesting question. I don't feel supported, but I don't feel attacked either. But also, um, I it, I've been doing activism since I was probably forever, but um, certainly since my PhD days. And I sort of, um, I had a lot of criticism, but also a lot of protection. And it was clear that the concept of academic freedom pr protects you in raising awareness of issues and holding debates. I mean, there's a whole way of, an academic way of sort of bolstering activism and creating a home to have, um, the discussions you need to have around a topic and bringing experts together and strategizing. So it's clear that there's a space in academia for helping out with activism. 
and and um, and certainly when by the time I came to the UK, I had a permanent position. Um, I wasn't going to let anybody push me around. And I also felt that I had to do it because I also have more junior colleagues who are like, oh, can I go to the demo? Can I do this? Can I do that? And it's like, well, yes, of course you can. And you can speak out. And in fact, you have a duty to speak out. And the other thing is we, we were talking about sort of studying the, the source of failure or, or trying to understand where the scientific approach went wrong. And to me, it really went wrong when we, when we sort of we sort of accepted defeat when we accepted a um, more circumscribed role in the kinds of pronouncements and positions we allow ourselves to take in public and that we don't um, speak from the Can heart. You, that's an interesting point. So when you say you accepted a more circumscribed role, you, did, you accepted that role from, from where? I mean, do you, was that... I, 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 I didn't. But I could see my colleagues did, that they, took, they internalized this idea that if you're going to be a scientist out in public, you have have to speak with all the caveats and you can't ever say I really feel this is important or I'm scared or you can't speak emotionally you have to speak very clinically and you can't say like I really wish ExxonMobil you know was, was shot off into the sun because I do and they probably do but they wouldn't allow themselves to just say that right and so you don't allow yourself to speak you don't allow yourself to speak directly as a real person with integrity and one of the things mm -hmm. that I find really important is to say to my colleagues and to and to to say to the to, to whoever, I do not lose integrity as a scientist when I when I demonstrate politically as a citizen or when I speak as a person for my beliefs. I do not lose that integrity. I get to go and campaign for politicians. I do not lose integrity. I get to even if I wanted to present myself as a politician, I do not lose scientific integrity because of that. The scientific integrity has to do with studying stuff in a certain way and with a certain method so that your results are robust. And I care about reality. I am not going to let my results be influenced by that stuff because I care about reality. I really care about understanding reality out there. Yeah. But, um, but, the, but the, in fact, we lose integrity when we speak in a detached way about problems as huge as climate change, right? Um, or when we allow our language to be bossed around and we use terms like climate change instead of global warming because mm. the fossil fuel industry, global warming, they thought it was scary. It's terrifying. Mm. So, you know, when we allow ourselves to sort of be bossed around and limit the way we present ourselves, I think that then we start losing integrity. And so I'm deliberately trying to present another view of what a scientist can do and can be. And I think that's such a good point. Sorry. Um, yeah. for, for me, I guess my question to you, whilst we're sort of still on this topic is, I mean, is this peculiar to science? Because I, I'm, I'm, you know, as a former academic who quit academia because I thought, well, go in, this is not what it's about. Um, I mean, isn't the question really what, what is the role of, of an academic? I mean, for me, universities, the whole, the, you know, the university system has been an absolute failure because what it's done is, is it's adapted itself to studying problems of knowledge, but not problems of how to live and how to live well and how to solve societal problems. Um, it's almost as if the, the the academic system, certainly in the UK, is just in, in the pocket of the economy. You know, it's not it's oh. not it's not a thought leader. Um, it's just yeah. towing the line. Um, so I wonder whether you know, because one of the one of my worries is that is that the, the finger of blame is being pointed at the scientists, whereas for me, you know, there are some invisible agents in all of this. I think, and it isn't just scientists and, and academics and other scholars within universities, but isn't it? Isn't it those people at the top of the tree who were actually perpetuating this problem? Um, in other words, people like your, your vice chancellors, your PBC's research. To me, I think, part, I think they're a big part of the problem too. Um, and I don't want to put you on the spot because you know, I can say those sorts of things because I'm not employed by a university anymore. And I, I fully appreciate that it's difficult for someone who is employed to, 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 you know, to cast a critical eye on, on some of those sorts of issues. But, but personally, it seems to me that it's, it's a big problem. It's a huge problem. And um, I think there's several things. First of all, in the, the, so I'm, I'm able to do a lot of research and I, I have a lot of resources, which is money. <laughs> and, and I have a lot of resources and the money buys people and the people are extraordinarily tremendous, fantastic PhD students and postdocs and they go off and they do the most amazing research and I just sort of watch them go and I'm amazed. 
but I am allowed to have those resources and the, the, this one particularly huge project I have, which is called Living with it Well Within Limits, and it's huge compared to anything else I had, it's tiny in the grand scheme of things. Um, and that's from the Leverhulm Trust. And specifically, they fund things that the research councils won't fund. And I was able to write an application saying, oh my goodness, you will not believe how much the research councils refuse to fund the research I'm interested in doing. And now we're getting all these papers out and people are really interested in it and we're, we're doing all this great stuff that there is no research council in the UK that would fund because if you do it grand, partly because it's interdisciplinary and you know we're looking at technology and well-being and the economy and like we cross over research and the planetary processes we cross over research councils so right there we're in trouble but also because of the fact that the priorities are dictated by what is perceived to be in the economic interest and this is something that in its in present incarnation that's very uh, dates back to the imposition of austerity, for instance, under Cameron, and the, the research councils were going to lose all their budgets, and uh, the solution was, no, we help the economy, so you have to keep funding us. And now it's written into every research proposal that goes into UK research councils is how much your research will help the economy grow. And it's like, mm -hmm. what if the economy needs to degrow? What if we need to change things really completely? It doesn't, that is not in the cards. So if you want to do that kind of research, and some people are able to do really interesting, really creative research, you're always playing against the rules. You're always playing a certain, presenting a certain view of what you're doing, but really trying to do something else with it. It is not a system that allows you to do really um, interesting stuff. And, it's, and you're right, it's dangerous. And the research councils are really in this sort of like defensive position with respect to the rest of the economy. And they allow themselves to be bossed around in terms of what the priorities should be. Yeah, um, I, I, I totally agree. So, I mean, this is a, a difficult question, but what, what, how, how can we get a, how can we get away from that? How do we change that broken system? I think that we can start with demands. Uh, so, one of the things is we have student demands to study different economics, but um, the economics departments are very unresponsive. But we can have demands from um, from students and they sort of walk with their feet. So leads um, within our School of Earth and Environment, uh, within the Sustainability Research Institute, we have a very, very good um, worldwide renowned masters on ecological economics and students come every year, more and more students come to our masters and that's great. So one of the things we're seeing is we're seeing student demand for certain topics because they want to learn about stuff that's actually going to help them understand and navigate the century ahead. Um, so that's that's one thing. I think uh, another thing is is being vocal critics about it. So we have a duty as academics not to just take the world as we're given it. We always have a system within. We always have to play the rules of the system we're in, but we still have a lot of freedom to criticize that system and to try to change it. You know, through learned bodies, through prizes, through this or that. You can. You can use your voice and, and what systems there are to try to change things. So you have to be clever about it. But I think that people should be a lot braver and more outspoken about this because I think it is, it is leading us into trouble. I, I, I completely agree. And in fact, <laughs> I did actually contact a university this week um, calling them out for their hypocrisy. Um, I'm trying to think of a way of not identifying the university. But, uh, but, but you know, like, like many universities, they have an estate, a sustainability agenda and they have their vision and their, you know, they, they're going to meet their, you know, they're going to achieve carbon zero, achieve carbon neutrality and so forth. Um, and, but I pointed out to this, <laughs> this university, well, why are you still offering qualifications in, in subjects that are actually contributing to the problem and making things worse? Um, Was it the of Leeds? I'm sorry? Was it Leeds? Because we do that. No, I, I mean, a lot of universities do, but no, this one, it wasn't, it wasn't Leeds University, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you when we're not recording which, which one it was, but uh, I know it's just occurred to me that we should, you know, that, that we, we really should be calling out the, the, the university system, not just in the UK, but globally, for saying, what, why, you know, you're supposed to be thought leaders, you're supposed to be visionaries, and if you guys can't lead the way, who's going to do it for us? Um, anyway, that's that, that's probably sort of going slightly off topic, but it's one of my one of my pet pet um, concerns at the moment. Um, so recently, um, in the I think it was in the Ecologist, there was an article by by Kevin Anderson and Isaac Stoddard, and I have huge respect for Kevin Anderson. He's one of our top climate scientists, 
and he speaks with you know he speaks with urgency he doesn't just communicate about the urgency he could he's been with urgency and, and you and you do as well you do it very well and in the article kevin I, I i read it and i couldn't quite believe that he was saying these things but he said you know he said the paris agreement he said it's he almost came out with a statement which said it's, it's dead in the water um he yeah he, he said it's like like the dodo and I thought, if, if if there are leading climate scientists and you know ecological economists and and the scientific community are, are now openly saying the Paris Agreement is dead in the water, should we shouldn't we should we just unite? Should the scientific and academic voices unite and just say, you know what, it's dead in the water, we need something else, or is that do you think that would be too much of a risk? Okay, so I'm not going to speak uh, very, very politically here, but before the Paris Agreement, um, the consensus among my climate science, so I'm not a natural scientist on the climate side. I do only the, the stuff to do with the social science. But um, the, the sort of statement that you would hear at coffee breaks or meetings or whatever was, yeah, I mean, we'll never, you know, even two degrees is probably not possible right now. And the Paris Agreement kind of came as a shock to everybody because they were like, Oh, the politicians are telling us now the political system, because the, the, the international agreements are political, right? They're not, they're, the scientific community doesn't write them. Um, and so all of a sudden, the, 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 I actually thought it was very positive because you had all these people who were going around being totally uh, depressed and saying two degrees. Now at the time, I must say that two degree people didn't, there was not this awareness of them. Um, the full horror of the of the climate impacts that two degrees represents. I think that that only came to everybody's consciousness in 2018, which is quite late with the 1.5 degree report mm -hmm. from the IPCC. But so so I think that Paris Agreement itself was good because it sort of gave people a big push and said, okay, well try to imagine what it takes to get to 1.5 degrees. And what Kevin is saying now is, all right, we've had that space of imagination and we're not on that trajectory. The things that would make it possible are not happening. They're not happening anywhere near fast enough. Or in a, you know, even countries that claim to take it seriously, like Sweden and the UK, are, are really not doing enough. So what chance does it have? And I think that that's really the, the core statement here is to, is to point out that the trajectory of countries that say they're climate leaders is a completely false one. So it's not that it's impossible, it's still possible. It's not possible with the kind of leadership and direction we have now, no way. And I think that that's a really important, clear statement to make. So it's not physically impossible. You can still imagine, you know, people stop consuming stuff, we stop having growth dependent economies, we start, you know, investing where we need to invest and in allowing people to use less stuff and getting cars off the road and all of that. And um, we get there. But that's not happening. And so he, what Kevin's pointing out is that that's not happening. And we need, I think that we do need the scientific community to unite and sort of attack their governments for not doing enough. <laughs> that would be really great to see and to do it publicly. Because when you do it behind closed doors, behind closed doors, it happens all the time that scientists say, you know, that's not enough, but they don't dare to speak out publicly because then they're afraid they're not going to be invited back to the meetings and that they won't even be able to talk to anybody after that. So I think that we need to be much more, much more proactive and have a public voice on this. Indeed, things are not happening anywhere um, fast enough or, or, or strongly enough or with any kind of seriousness. And it's really super dangerous and it's going to kill lots of people. So it would be nice if the scientific community on the climate side could learn from the scientific community on the coronavirus side and the epidemiologists who've had to really sort of stand up and say, no, you actually need to declare lockdown. You need to, we need to wear masks. We need to do this. We need to wear that, do that. And, and, um, and really took much more of a proactive role in telling the public what's going to happen if we don't take things seriously and do a climate version of the coronavirus response which is to take things seriously and act as though lives are on the line, which they are. Uh, yeah. So that's what I would really like to see as a, as a change. But I don't think that there's anything to, to happen where the scientific community comes together and say, we need a new version of the Paris Agreement. That's not our role. We're not, we are not the politicians in that sense. Mm -hmm. We can call the politicians to account and say, you are not doing the things we need you to do for the thing you signed up to. And the thing you signed up to is really important to save lives, by the way. 
it's really hard isn't it because i can imagine that the politicians response would be well well what, you know we're not hearing from our you know the mps are not hearing from their constituents that, that they're bothered about yeah. climate this, this this is the issue that came up when I when I when I did the Ask a Scientist session with the psychologists, um, and I put to them, well, why do they think that you know the public really got behind you know the, they accepted lockdown, they accepted the need for that. Um, can you imagine the public accepting that um, you know they they're going to have to get rid of their their um, their cars by sort of 2025 something like that. Um, and one of the you know and, it's, and it was it was a good answer. And it's obviously it's a fairly obvious one too is that. In the context of COVID, then you know the measure of, of which is people dying. Well, that's really immediate. You know, we get that as human beings, we get that. But if we talk about measures in relation to climate, then it's you know CO2 levels, emissions, um, loss of Arctic sea ice, that kind of thing, which don't really feel very relevant to us as humans, and unless you've actually done a bit of work and you understand what that then means. So it's as if I think there's a big gap in terms of you know, not just in terms of what the public actually knows about what's going on, but it's also a gap in terms of, you know, how we communicate the consequences and the implications of all of this. Um, you know, we don't seem to have the communicators there who can do that sort of translation, or at least not enough of them. Um, you know, you're a brilliant communicator and, you know, your Twitter is always full, full of all sorts of really important, interesting things, but you're in a minority, I feel. Um, you yeah, know, so how can we, I suppose, how do we mobilise yeah. people more quickly, more effectively. So that's where I think that the, the role of the scientific community really is important because we should be on television every day, we should be on the radio every day, we should be you know, doing the things that the epidemiologists that we're explaining to the world that coronavirus is really serious before a single person dies of it. You know, that's the challenge is right now we already have people dying of climate change, but you just spoke about sea ice. The, that's, the reason people are dying of climate change is indirectly it's a whole planetary system that does include the sea ice but there are direct paths between climate impacts they're both direct and indirect paths between climate impacts and people dying in storms in droughts in floods through hunger um through instability so there are all kinds of ways that the climate system is in, through disease as well not necessarily coronavirus but through other diseases we know that are coming because of climate change and so there are very good, very clear, very easy arguments to say, we need to act on this because it is going to hurt us. It is already hurting some people and it is going to hurt more and more of us as time goes on. Thousands of people have already died of it on every single continent in the world. And we need to be much more um, willing to claim the public health implications of climate. Um, and, and because the, the, we were always, we're always been, again, we've, we come back to this thing that we've always been intimidated by the fossil fuel industry and they're saying, oh, you can't prove that this person in the heat wave died because of climate change. And it's like, the, the, you know, they're always going back to, oh, you can't, it's a probabilistic thing, you can't show it. Mm. And, and now we see them doing the same thing with coronavirus. So there's this whole coronavirus truther thing saying, oh, well, this person had a, a, a comorbidity. Everybody mm. has comorbidities, so nobody died of coronavirus. Mm. And, and you know, so, so we see that they're using the same arguments against every type of science imaginable, because what they don't want is they don't want disruption to the economy. Mm. That's a, that's scary. So no, we need to claim that and just say this is happening. It's real. And just because you don't want disruption to the economy doesn't mean that that disruption isn't going to save lives. Just in this case, we really need to disrupt the economy. We need to build it up differently. We need to have job guarantees to help people get to work to build it up differently. It's going to take a lot of work. Nobody gets to sit at home. <laughs> no more is, if, the positive thing about climate change is if you're going to take it seriously, nobody sits at home. It's not like coronavirus. We get out of the lockdown once things are safe and we rebuild everything. So, you know, that's, that's um, hopefully positive. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's, you know, that, that dealing with the, the fossil fuel lobby and, and to some extent, the economists I, i've had some the, some of the most oh, yeah. bizarre conversations i've had have been with economists and and yeah. i remember speaking to one who i won't, won't, won't mention um but he's he's involved with a with a far right publication um and i said to him after after an interview i said what do you, do you do you really believe that climate change isn't happening and he looked at me and i and i swear he was being authentic and, and speaking what he thought was his personal truth 
He said, well, it's, it's probability, isn't it? I just couldn't, I couldn't quite believe it that, that for him, you know, it, it's, it, it boiled down to a matter of probability. And, um, and it was almost as if he was saying, well, the climate has changed before and the likelihood of this is X and we might get it wrong. And, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't quite figure out whether that was, was a, a form of denial um, or whether it was a, a sort of genuine disbelief that, you know, that, that, that according to his, his, his knowledge system and his so, values and so on. Um, yeah, I think that that's, I mean, a lot of these things boil down to values. They, they boil down to not being comfortable with a, with, a mm -hmm. with a fact and reality that clashes with your belief system. And that's, again, one of the things where physics kinds of helps to have a physics background because you mm -hmm. learn that reality includes lots of things that you can't really make sense of, like, you know, quantum physics doesn't make sense, but it's real, it happens, so deal with it. And so if you take that approach to reality that is real and you have to deal with it, mm -hmm. then climate change is not probabilistic, it's happening. It mm -hmm. is like so well known, you know, and the fact that ExxonMobil knew it was happening and could tell you where we are, like in 1982, they had a report that's telling us exactly where we are now because we are on the business as usual trajectory mm -hmm. in terms of carbon concentration in the atmosphere and temperature rise, mm -hmm. right? That's not probabilistic, his friends at Exxon knew. So, but it's really about this belief system that says mm -hmm. that we can't have a large social intervention in the economy in order to protect ourselves from this disaster that's about to happening, that, about, that is happening and about to get a lot worse. And that's what they're really trying to avoid. So the people who have an ideological objection to climate change, which is a lot of people, including a lot of economists, um, what they really want to avoid is a social mobilization for collective protection. That's what they're fighting against, is some form of socialism that allows us to help each other. Because yeah. we're not going to do it as, as solitary, rugged individuals. <laughs> it's a planet. It's always, in, it's always, you know, follow the money and what's at stake. You know, there are certain things that you learn and they're, and they, they're, they're always true. Um, there's just one, one sort of final question I'd like to ask you just to, just to sort of wrap this up. Um, I, you know, like, like you, I and many other people, we were sort of massively disappointed that, you know, that, I mean, that COP was delayed for a year. So it's November 2021, which makes me think, crikey, what's you know, at, at the speed with which things are happening now, a year is, uh, that's a long, long time. Um, what, are, what are your hopes for COP26 in Glasgow? And um, what, what do you think we could hope for? What do you think we could do to try and, you know, facilitate, bring about um, a good outcome? So I think the most important thing is to stay on, is to, to keep up with the, mo the momentum with activism and pressure. So I don't think that any of these national governments are going to do anything. So um, uh, I have a piece of personal news, which is that I'm actually leaving Leeds and moving to Switzerland. I have a job in um, a professorship in Lausanne starting up. So the Swiss government is doing even less than the UK government, if you can imagine it. Mm -hmm. um, so, all <laughs> uh, so all these national governments won't do anything unless they are pushed. And so what I'm really hoping is that this mobilization, um, there was this idea of, the, of climate activists that if they became accepted at the COP, that if they gained access to the COP, they could access, they could influence the um, negotiations. I think that what needs to happen now is that we need to have activism uh, within each country to pass things within each country that are ambitious beyond Par the Paris Agreement, because the Paris Agreement, you know, you're not sure you're gonna hit it, the climate sensitivity might be a bit higher, you might not. Um, so we need to, to get, um, within each country, politicians have to have their feet to the fire. So I mean, scientists need to speak out and activists, you know, need to be doing stuff that's really confrontational. Um, and we're seeing that things can change fast. I mean, if you told me two months ago that Minneapolis would de defund their police department, I'd have told you you were smoking some really good stuff. <laughs> but they did. So social change can make things happen really fast. And I think that's where we have to focus. The focus can't be the cop. The focus has to be on how we change our national governments and how we bully and push around our negotiators. Now, it turns out politicians are not thought leaders either. They get pushed around. Some of them have strong convictions. Some of them have strong integrity. A lot of them just follow the winds. And we need to make sure the wind is blowing to push them in the way of strong climate action and that we are relentless and that we are public and that we do not take nice words behind closed doors as an answer. 
uh, that we have to play this game. This is a combat sport. This is not. This is not a tea party, okay? <laughs> you know, this is not like if we do this and we're nice and we say things a certain way, we'll win. No, we win when we fight. So we need yeah. to be fighting. We need to take this as a mobilization. We need to be relentless and we need to, um, and I don't care if you're a scientist or a journalist or um, whatever your role is. I was speaking to composers the other day and they're like, what can we do? Okay. We'll compose the marches to the revolution. <laughs> Come on, you know. Right. I mean, step up, step up. So, so, uh, so we need to, we need, we need to do the things that will push in each of our roles that will push our governments to act, that will push the public to care and to really um, get concerned, and really push for large change. So we have both things. We have the disaster that's coming, and we have large change necessary. And in the middle is. Uh, activist movements that will make that change happen. That is how change happens. Yeah. It does not yeah. happen automatically or because we're nice or because we're polite or because we write nice papers. It matters yeah. because we, the way it happens is because we do, uh, when changes happen is because there's been popular pressure and we need to build that. I completely agree. Um, and yeah, I mean that, you know, sort of nice, nice conversations and a word I hate is compromise as an academic. I loathe compromise because you always came away with a suboptimal outcome um, and this is not a situation i think where we where compromises should should be on the table at all